because we have with us a weather reporter, a meteorologist in his own right, a climate reporter who's actually going to put El Nino for us in the context of climate change. And that is Kalein Hossein. And Kalein is a multimedia journalist, as I mentioned earlier, based here in Trinidad and Tobago. Since 2014, he has reported on weather, climate, and the environment for his online media company, Trinidad and Tobago Weather Center. In 2019, he joined Guardian Media as their weather anchor, producing compelling weather, climate, and environment coverage across television, print, digital, and radio. Kalein has led Guardian Media's coverage through inclement weather events like tropical cyclones and floods, as well as international climate conferences such as COP27. And most recently, he is uh, has become a Greenleaf Awardee, the EMA's prestigious environmental awards that took place just yesterday. So congratulations again to you, Kalein, and thank you for being here today. All right. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Um, Omar, you might have to enable that for me to get my slides up and running. Omar? Uh, you don't have it enabled for you yet? Uh, there we go. It's up yeah. for me now. Okay. Great. Share. All right. Great. So what everyone's looking at right now is actually the sea surface temperature anomalies as of Sunday. And what you are noticing is those brighter orange, yellows, those are areas that are above average sea surface temperatures. And we are transitioning into an El Nino phase. So two areas I would like to highlight. Um, you may be able to see my cursor. So the first is look at the Atlantic. The Atlantic right now is one of the warmest ever recorded in recent history with um, a significant area east of Trinidad and Tobago towards Europe, even in the far North Atlantic, well above average temperatures. And the second area that I'd like to focus on is just off the coast of Ecuador and Peru. Look at that high um, sea surface temperature anomaly that extends across the Pacific. And that's the area that we're going to be focusing on today. That's where we would look for for classifying an El Nino. So today we're looking at the impacts of, let me get my slides up and running properly. There we go. Yeah. So we're looking at El Nino, uh, the Southern Oscillation, El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO and climate change. Now, before I jump into how El Nino is affected or ENSO is affected by climate change, it's important to note that this is still an area that is under active scientific investigation, as Gary mentioned, uh, and so itself, and then how climate change actually affects it. So these specific impacts are still being researched. There's varying degrees of certainty with new scientific literature being published uh, regularly, like weekly, monthly, yearly. And it's also important to note that no El Nino or La Nina event is really ever the same. We see different impacts across the world, and each one always has some different aspect to it. So how is climate change affecting ENSO, or the El Nino Southern Oscillation? So we're starting to see, at least based on the literature, that there's increasing frequency and intensity of El Nino events. So some models suggest that temperatures could increase in frequency uh, or increasing warming uh, global temperatures will increase the frequency of El Nino events. So that would mean periods of warmer and drier conditions in certain regions and then cooler and wetter conditions in others. Now, climate change might not only make El Nino events more frequent, but more intense as a result of warmer average temperatures. And we could also see stronger El Nino events, which could lead to more extreme weather events around the world. Now, I'm using weather and climate, but they are not interchangeable. Climate is over a much longer period in meteorology and climatology. We use the climate average of 30 years. This is weather is our day-to-day -day ex uh, weather experiences, so what we experience outside. But Computer models uh, that are used for projecting future climates correctly predict global warming increasing due to increasing greenhouse gas emissions, as well as short-term year-to-year natural climate variations associated well with El Nino and La Nina. 
So what you're looking at here now is a much longer time period compared to the prior slide, which only took into account up until 1980 or 1990. But this one goes all the way back to 1850. And you can see those red bars where it exceeds 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. It's actually well that those are the different El Nino events and where it's negative 0 0.5 degrees Celsius or below, those are La Nina events. But these models that we use to, uh, you know, project El Nino and La Nina events there and future global climate models specifically, there's still quite a bit of discrepancy on how the tropical Pacific, where we look for this La Nina and El Nino events to form, it's still quite a bit of discrepancy on how the tropical Pacific Ocean will actually warm in future global climate scenarios. So researchers for the last several decades have been working to reduce the persistent uncertainties that we've had in the tropical Pacific warming projections, but many climate models simulate El Nino and La Nina events of similar intensity. But in nature, we actually see the warming events with El Nino tend to be much stronger than the cooling events associated with La Nina. So in other words, most models with El Nino and La Nina show them some being symmetric, but in reality, it's asymmetric in nature. So a new study that was actually published a couple, two or three years ago, so scientists observed uh, or analyzed observational data and found that numeral, numerous climate model simulations found that models simulate the subsurface ocean currents variations more accurately, and the simulated asymmetry between El Nino and La Nina increases, becoming more like what we've seen in nature. So the models are improving like the science as it improves, but there's still the high uncertainty in the intensity change of El Nino and La Nina in response to greenhouse, greenhouse gas warming uh, that remains an issue. So we're getting there, but we're not there just yet. So something else that researchers are looking at with regards to climate change and ENSO is the shifting spatial patterns of how El Nino and La Nina form. Now, Gary went over the traditional uh, La Nina and El Nino models, but what we're actually seeing is some changes to how that El Nino forms. Now, we know that La Nina is below average temperatures, below 0 0.5 degrees Celsius in a specific part of the Pacific Ocean for a certain period of time with the respective changes in the atmosphere. Similar El Nino is the above average temperatures above 0 0.5 degrees Celsius in that same specific area of the Pacific Ocean and the respective atmospheric changes. But with climate change, we are seeing that a different type of El Nino and La Nina forming called a La Nina or El Nino Madoki. Now, Madoki is actually a Japanese word meaning similar but different. So in the classic El Nino event, sea surface temperatures usually become warm in the eastern Pacific Ocean. So that's along um, the east coast of South America and Central America. But in an El Nino Madoki, the warming primarily occurs in the Central Pacific um, between the international dateline and 140 degrees west rather than in the Eastern Pacific. And then the Central Pacific warming is then flanked on both sides by cooler than normal sea surface temperatures. And then the atmospheric processes respond to this warming uh, pattern. So that's the Walker cell that Gary spoke about. Um, and it's very different from our usual um, La Nina or El Nino events, because in an El Nino Madoki, though we still see that suppressive phase of the atmosphere across the Caribbean region, we still see, you know, this very different sea surface temperature change, which has knock-on effects for coastal areas of both the Western Pacific, or Eastern Pacific rather, and uh, Western Pacific Oceans. Same, similarly, for La Nina Madoki, we see a similar response to the regular La Nina, but those sea surface temperature changes are vastly different. Now, scientists are also looking at the potential for longer duration events as a result of climate change. Now, episodes of El Nino and La Nina typically last about 12 months, but some can, sometimes can last for years. We're actually coming out of a, a nearly three year long La Nina event. And El Nino and La Nina events occur every two to seven years, but on average, they don't occur on a regular schedule. And generally, El Nino occurs more frequently than a La Nina, but with increased global sea surface temperatures due to global warming, El Nino events may last longer than they have historically, and that could magnify their impacts, which I will get to a little bit on. Now, something else that has happened as a result of climate change is that the accuracy of the ENSO prediction models, it's becoming more uncertain. 
So what you're looking at on screen is actually the latest rounds of, of forecast from the CANSIPS, which is one of the climatological models we use for forecasting El Nino. And you can see that as time went on, we eventually got more and more, more, and more precise in where uh, the El Nino is actually going to evolve. So the last two forecasts that were issued um, in March and March, April, and May were actually close together. But if you look at the earlier forecast, December, January, and February, they are a little bit off compared to where the forecasts are finally landing. Now, there's also something called the spring predictability barrier. Um, this is when models are generally less accurate when they're used to make predictions during the northern hemispheric spring, typically from April to June. And this the spring prediction barrier evolves generally with the annual cycle. Around springtime, the atmospheric system goes through a reset phase transitioning from one phase to the other. And the precise physical mechanisms on this SPB or spring, predict pr spring predictability barrier still ongoing, but the common theory right now is relative stability of the ocean atmospheric systems and small disturbances that could change wind direction and all that stuff. But the prediction generally of ENSO events could become more difficult in the coming years due to increased variability in the sea surface temperatures and other factors influenced by climate change. Now, we will also likely see changes in rainfall patterns as a result of climate change. Now, climate change will affect the global atmospheric circulation, which will influence rainfall patterns, exacerbating flood and drought conditions. So what you're looking at on screen is typically what we see with an El Nino event. So for the Caribbean region, we generally see, as Gary mentioned, a drier than usual pattern um, from June through the following March, March. So what you would see is that that encompasses the Atlantic hurricane season period, which runs from June to November. It also encompasses our typical wet season in Trinidad and Tobago and the Eastern Caribbean, which runs anywhere from late May all the way through December and even into the subsequent um, beginning of the dry season. And I don't need to remind many of you how dry it got during the previous El Nino events. So we're talking about uh, beginning of 2019, where many of our reservoirs dropped below 50 percent capacity. In fact, the Kearney Arena Reservoir, which was uh, which is our largest reservoir in Trinidad, um, dropped below 10%, which was extremely concerning. But thankfully, when we switched to that El Nino phase, La Nina phase rather, uh, by the end of 2019 into 2020, um, those uh, water levels started rising again. Looking elsewhere across the world, we see drier conditions in an El Nino phase across much of the uh, Western Pacific, uh, parts of Africa, South Africa, and as uh, sub-Saharan Africa as well, and parts of India. And these ramifications can be significant, especially when you have drought that devastatingly affects agricultural um, farms and agricultural areas, but you also have conversely where it's extremely wet. Thankfully, during an El Nino, El Nino event, we see that wet pattern typically play out across the ocean, where if rain falls, it really doesn't matter for us on land. But for areas like the southern part of the United States, uh, parts of Western China and the Middle East, all the way to the parts of the Sahel, we can see significant floods uh, that can cause loss of life. Conversely, in a La Nina event, we see the opposites. We see wetter than usual conditions that runs from June through March, so that same period where our wet season, hurricane season, and beginning of the dry season coincide across the Atlantic uh, Caribbean basin. We see wetter than usual conditions as well. And that's what we've been in for the past three years. So that's why our water, even though we've seen a reduction in the amount of rainfall that falls during the dry season, which is typical, we didn't end up in a drought-like pattern. But if you look at a lot of the climate models for the next coming um next coming months, they are suggesting that we get less than average rainfall across Trinidad and Tobago. The Met Office official forecast for the wet season, um, their climate predictions show that we are expecting to see near normal um, rainfall totals through the end of the year, but that doesn't mean we will see completely dry or completely wet conditions. It will fluctuate as our weather does in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, something else that will happen as a result of climate change with El Nino will be that we'll start to see warmer oceans. And that always happens with El Nino, but when we already have a baseline that is exceptionally high compared to average, that means we could see knock-on effects for the marine ecosystem. So what you're looking at right now is the current sea surface temperature normally globally um, 
between 60 south and 60 north so that encompasses the tropical atlantic tropical pacific and right now it is the hottest recorded since 1981 by 0.4 degrees celsius which is exceptionally high and as we have higher ocean temperatures that will lead to uh, more co2 in our atmosphere being absorbed into the ocean and that will change the ocean chemistry and could influence dynamics with the ocean atmosphere interactions that drive enso but also it will have an impact on our marine systems. Hotter oceans tend to bleach corals, which we have seen in Trinidad and Tobago. In the past, the Great Barrier Reef is one of those famous examples during a La Nina event where waters are warmer across the Pacific, Western Pacific Ocean where the Great Barrier Reef is. So that is also something to take into consideration. Now, something else that will happen as a result of climate change will be sea level rising differently across different parts of the world. So warmer water tends to expand. A lack of well, colder water makes it more dense. So this expanded warm water will cause a rise in sea level, which can be observable from space. So what you're looking at is previous El Nino events in 1997 and 2015, where you would see uh, sea surface height anomalies detected from satellites that can show a rise upwards of 200 millimeters across the Western Pacific Ocean. And generally, once we have a warmer ocean, it means we'll have higher sea levels in addition to all the water that is melting from our polar glaciers and land glaciers that are now that fresh water entering the ocean. So with a warmer planet, generally warmer seas with or without El Nino. El Nino just makes that height difference, especially along the west, uh, eastern, yeah, western coast of South America could be as high as 13 inches above uh, normal in some instances. And that is some of the impacts that we see, tend to see with El Nino and La Nina as a result of climate change. But I just want to reiterate that this is still an area under active investigation and that science could change as quickly as tomorrow because multiple scientists around the world who are under, taking this under active investigation, uh, they are pursuing this quite hotly because these impacts from El Nino and La Nina have major ramifications for multiple countries globally. Now back to the Caribbean region for Trinidad, Tobago, and the island chain as we go up. So as I mentioned earlier, El Nino tends to bring reduced rainfall for the region. So this often results in drier than normal conditions for the Caribbean, particularly during the region's wet season, which could lead to droughts, as I mentioned earlier, and water shortages that could affect both people and ecosystems. Now, during an El Nino phase, the dry season might, might experience slightly more rainfall than usual, which alters the re region's typical precipitation patterns. Now, there's also an impact on agriculture when we have less rainfall, right? Severe, it, less rainfall means we could see crop failure, it could affect livestock, which could lead to food insecurity and hardships, especially for those islands that have a fairly larger percentage of their economy based on agriculture. Now, generally during an El Nino event, there's reduced Atlantic hurricane activity. And that's because of that walker circulation that Gary mentioned earlier. We El Nino events tend to increase vertical wind shear across the Caribbean region and the Atlantic, which could disrupt the formations of tropical cyclones and hurricanes. But it's important to note that even though during an El Nino event, there may be uh, fewer tropical cyclones, it does not reduce the risk of tr strong hurricanes forming. And think back to our last El Nino event, um, we actually had a, a Cat 5 form in the Atlantic Basin, because with less storms, we tend to see the Atlantic Ocean warm up quite a bit. So when one does form, it takes very much advantage of the warm ocean temperatures that exist in the Atlantic Basin. And with warmer ocean or warmer sea surface temperatures associated with El Nino, it can cause coral bleaching, which is harmful to the region's coral reef, reef specifically um, in the Southwestern uh, Caribbean Sea. But when we have a uh, warmer ocean generally, this effect on coral reefs can be spread across the globe and with the warmer waters as well and drier conditions across the Atlantic Basin, we can see a decrease in the amount of fresh water that enters the sea and that could also change salinity levels, which can also stress coral reefs. And lastly, which is something that, from, in my opinion, is less reported, would be the public health concerns as a result of El Nino. 
So the direct impacts from an El Nino in the Caribbean region could be extreme weather events like heat waves or the indirect effects like the changes in how uh, vector-borne diseases are spread. So altered rainfall patterns could influence the breeding habits uh, for mosquitoes, which carry Z uh, diseases like Zika, dengue, chikungunya. But again, it's important to note these potential impacts with these potential impacts, specific effects can vary from one El Nino to the other and depends on other factors like specific geographic location and local climate conditions. So what happens in Trinidad and Tobago may not be the exact same thing that plays out across, let's say, the ABC Islands north of Venezuela or just off the north coast of Colombia, for example. And conversely, because this is an ENSO topic, the other side of La Nina, El Nino is La Nina. So, with the La Nina, we see increased rainfall, which could lead to flooding and landslides, especially in areas with steep terrain and poor infrastructure, like we saw in Tobago last year uh, in October to November, where they recorded the highest number of landslides ever reported within a month. And with all this rainfall, it will also have impacts on agriculture with crop damage and particularly areas that receive, well, experience water shortages. They now have a water surplus, and that could have a knock-on effect on the crop prices as well. Now, during a La Nina event, because we have less vertical wind shear in the Atlantic, uh, we have a generally upwards uh, increased rising motion of the atmosphere, we tend to see an increased uh, tropical cyclone activity in the Atlantic Basin, which always has significant in, uh, impacts for whichever islands it does impact eventually. And during a La Nina event, we have increased rainfall that leads to more fresh water runoff, which lowers sea salinity levels in nearshore areas, potentially affecting marine life. And in some cases, increased rainfall leads to increased nutrient runoff, which can also cause algal blooms and negatively impact water quality and marine ecosystems. This year, we're actually seeing quite a bit of algal blooms in the Gulf of Paria, which has impacted the desalination plant in Point Lisas, which has resulted in multiple times the desal plant being having to temporarily cease operations so that they can clear those algal blooms. And again, on the public health front, uh, La Nina can create more breeding habitats for mosquitoes that can carry mosquito-borne diseases like Zika, dengue, and chikungunya. And we also, during a uh, La Nina event with increased rainfall, we could see an increased risk of waterborne diseases like cholera when we have flooding events. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, we can chat more in the discussion after.